you know, I was making this decision about what do I want to focus on after VR? And I'm still working on VR regularly. I spend a day a week uh, kind of consulting with Meta. And I, you know, Boz styles me the consulting CTO. It's kind of like the Sherlock Holmes that comes in and consults on some of the specific tough issues. And I'm still pretty passionate about all of that. Uh, but I have been figuring out how to compartmentalize and uh, force that into a smaller box to work on some other things. And I did come down to this decision between working on uh, economical nuclear fission or artificial general intelligence. And uh, the fission side of things, I've, I've got a bunch of interesting things going that way, but it would take, that would be a fairly big project thing to do. Uh, I don't think it needs to be as big as people expect. I do think something original SpaceX sized, I. Uh, you build it, power your building off of it, and then the government, I think, will come around to what you need to. It's, everybody loves an existence proof. I think it's yeah. possible. Somebody should be doing this, but it's going to involve some politics. It's going to involve decent sized teams and a bunch of this cross functional stuff that I don't love. While the artificial general intelligence side of things, um, it seems to me like this is the highest leverage moment for potentially a single individual, potentially in the history of the world, where the things that we know about the brain, about what we can do with artificial intelligence, uh, nobody can say absolutely on any of these things, but I am not a madman for saying that it is likely that the code for artificial general intelligence is going to be tens of thousands of lines of code, not millions of lines of code, this is code that conceivably one individual could write, unlike writing a new web browser or operating system. And based on the progress that AI has, machine learning has made in the recent decade, it's likely that the important things that we don't know are relatively simple. There's probably a handful of things, and my bet is that I think there's less than six key insights that need to be made. Each one of them can probably be written on the back of an envelope. We don't know what they are, but when they're put together in concert with GPUs at scale and the data that we all have access to, that we can make something that behaves like a human being or like a living creature and that can then be educated in whatever ways that we need to get to the point where we can have universal remote workers where anything that somebody does mediated by a computer and doesn't require physical interaction uh, that an AGI will be able to do. We can already simulate the, you know, the equivalent of the Zoom, uh, the Zoom meetings with avatars and uh, synthetic deep fakes and whatnot. We can definitely do that. Uh, we have superhuman capabilities on any narrow thing that we can uh, that we could formalize and make a loss function for, but there's things we don't know how to do now. But I don't think they are unapproachably hard. Now, that's incredibly hubristic to say that it's like, but I think that what I said a couple years ago is a 50% chance that somewhere there will be signs of life of AGI in 2030. And I've probably increased that slightly. I may be at 55, 60% now, because I do think there's a little sense of acceleration there. I think that's likely the case. One of the things that appeals to so many people, including me, about the promise of AGI is we know that we're only drinking from a straw from the, the fire hose of all the information out there. I mean, you look at just in a, a very narrowly bounded field like machine learning, like you can't read all the papers that, that come out all the time. You can't go back and read all the clever things that people did in the 90s or earlier that people have forgotten about because they didn't pan out at the time when they were trying to do them with 12 neurons. Um, so the, this idea that yeah, I think there are gems buried in some of the older literature that was not the path taken by everything. And you can see a kind of herd mentality on the things that happen right now. It's almost funny to see like, oh, Google does something and OpenAI does something, Meta does something. And, you know, they're, they're the same people that all talk to each other and they're all one-upping each other and they're all capable of implementing each other's work given a month or two after somebody has an announcement of that. But there's a there's a whole world of possible approaches to machine learning and i think that we probably will in hindsight go back and see it's like yeah that was kind of clearly predicted by this early paper here uh, 
you know, and this turns out that if you do this and this and take this result from uh, from animal training and this thing from neuroscience over here and put it together and set up this curriculum for them to learn in, that that's kind of what it took. You don't have too many people now that are still saying it's not possible or it's going to take hundreds of years. And 10 years ago, you would get you would collect, get a collection of experts and you would have a decent chunk on the margin that either say not possible or couple hundred years, might be centuries, and the median estimate would be like 50, 70 years, and it's been coming down, and I know with me saying eight years for something, that still puts me on the optimistic side, but it's not crazy out in the fringes, and just being able to look at that at a, a meta level about the trend of the, the, uh, the trend of the predictions going down there, the idea that something could be happening relatively soon. Now, I do not believe in fast takeoffs. You know, that's one of the safety issues that people say it's like, oh, it's going to go foom and the AI is going to take over the world. There's a lot of reasons I don't think that's a credible position. And I think that we will go from a point where we start seeing things that that credibly look like uh, look like animals behaviors and uh, have a human voice box wired into them. Uh, it's like I tried to get Elon uh, to say, it's like your, your pig at Neuralink, give it a human voice box and let it start uh, learning human words. I, I think that, you know, I think animal intelligence is closer to human intelligence than a lot of people like to think. And I think that culture and modalities of IO are uh, make the gulf seem a lot bigger than it actually is. There's just that smooth spectrum of how the brain developed and cortexes and uh, scaling of different things going on there. The brain is a recurrent neural network generating an action policy. I mm -hmm. mean, it's implemented on a biological substrate. And, and it's interesting thinking about things like that, where we know fundamentally the brain is not a convolutional neural network or a transformer. Uh, those are specialized things that, that are very valuable for what we're doing, but it's not the way the brain's doing. Now, I do think consciousness and AI in general uh, is a substrate independent mechanism where it doesn't have to be implemented the way the brain is, but if you've only got one existence proof, there's certainly some value in caring about what it says and does. Um, and so the, the idea that anything that can be done with a narrow AI that you can quantify up a loss function for or reward mechanism, you're almost certainly going to be able to produce something that's more resource effective to train and deploy and use in an inference mode, you know, train a whole lot using an inference. But uh, a living being is going to be something that's a continuous, lifelong learned task agnostic thing. And we've got, you know, again, I have all the respect in the world for the amazing things that are being done now, but sometimes they can be taken a little bit out of context with things like, uh, like there's some smoke and mirrors going on, like the Gato, the recent work, the mm -hmm. multitask learning stuff. You know, it's amazing that it's the one, it's one model that plays all the Atari games, mm -hmm. I am, as well as doing all of these other things. But I, of course, it didn't learn to do all of those. It was instructed in doing that by other reinforcement learners going through and doing that. And even in the case of all the games, it's still going with a specific hand-coded reward function in each of those Atari games, where it's not that, you know, how does it, it just wants to spend its summer afternoon playing Atari because that's the most interesting thing for it. So it's, again, not a general, it's not learning the way humans learn. And there's, I believe, a lot of things that are challenging to make a loss function for that you can train uh, through these existing conventional things. We are going to chip away at all the things that people do um, that we can turn into narrow AI problems and billions of probably trillions of dollars of value are going to be created by that. But there's still going to be a set of things. And we've got questionable cases like the self-driving car where it's possible. It's not my bet, but it's it's plausible that the long tail could be problematic enough that that really does require a full-on artificial general intelligence. I, the counter argument is that data solves almost every, everything is an interpolation problem if you have enough data, and Tesla may be able to get enough data I, from all of their deployed stuff to be able to work like that, but maybe not. And there are all the other problems about, like, say you want to have a strategy meeting and you want to go ahead and bring in all of your remote workers and your consultants, and you want a world where some of those could be AIs that are, you know, that are talking and interacting with you in a an area that is too murky to have a crisp loss function, but they still have things that on some level they're they're rewarded on some internal level for building a valuable to humans 
uh, kind of life and ability to interact with things. And it's a it's a funny thing, because as far as I can tell, Elon is completely serious about all of his concerns about AGI you know, mm -hmm. being an existential threat. And you know, I, I tried to draw him out to talk about AI. And he just didn't want to. And I think that, you know, I get that little fatalistic sense from him. It's weird because his company could very well be the leading company yeah. leading towards a lot of that, where uh, Tesla being a super pragmatic company uh, that's doing things because they really want to solve this actual problem. It's a different vibe than the, the research oriented companies where it's a great time to be an AI researcher. You've got your pick of trillion dollar companies that will, you know, that will pay you to kind of work on the problems you're interested in. But that's not necessarily driving hard towards the, the core problem of AGI as something that's going to produce a lot of value by doing things that, you know, that people currently do or would like to do.